can sing. It doesn't really fit any of the other themes of your book at all. So. Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's program with Rachel Walker, Beauty and the Brain. We welcome everyone who is here in person in Worcester and also our robust, robust audience out in YouTube. So thank you for joining us. We are coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain in active presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Academic and Public Programs here. The American Antiquarian Society is a national research library with a mission to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary resources that are housed here behind where I am standing. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use our collections, both physical collections and also our digital collections, we host programs like this one that feature aspects of our collections and the fruits of research from collections, providing insights into the past that have resonance for today. And tonight's program is no exception to that. You can learn more about the AAS and our collections and our programs on our website at AmericanAntiquarian.org. As a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help keep this work going, and we thank you for that. And just know that we will have time for your questions later on in the program, so have your questions in mind, and we'll get to them toward the end after our speaker. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Rachel Walker is Assistant <coughs> Professor of History at the University of Hartford, where she teaches courses on the history of race, gender, and science in America. She is the author of Beauty and the Brain, The Science of Human Nature in Early America, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2022. And it has just received an honorable, men honorable mention for the Frederick Jackson Turner Award from the Organization of American Historians. Her recent article, Facing Race, received the Murren Prize for the best article published in Early American Studies in 2021. Rachel has held two short-term J. and Deborah Last fellowships here at the Society, first in 2015 and then in 2018. <coughs> and she has also held a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship here, a long-term fellowship, back in 2020. Those fellowships informed the work that she will speak to us about tonight on her recent book. Please welcome Rachel Walker. Thanks so much, Nan, for uh, that generous introduction. And also, uh, just to the American Antiquarian Society in general, oh, hi, Ben. <laughs> Um, this has been a really fabulous place for me as a scholar. I started coming here as a wee graduate student way back in 2015, as Nan mentioned. Um, but I was especially grateful for the long-term fellowship that I recently held here uh, between 2020 and 2021. If you all remember, we all were in the midst of a global pandemic. This was um, a time in which higher ed was in crisis. People were canceling classes, my colleagues were teaching extra classes, everyone was dealing with the horrors of hybrid learning and online education and adapting, you know, last minute. Um, and instead, as all my colleagues were doing that, I got to come here and just think and read and research and write every day, which was an enormously um, fruitful experience and something that I am forever grateful for. Um, and as you'll see today in this talk, I mean, this book has really served as the foundation, or this institution has really served as the foundation for, for this book. Um, so many of the primary sources, the manuscripts, the uh, rare books, the periodicals, and also the images. You'll see a ton of images in here um, came from these archival collections. Um, so I organized my talk around um, some of the collections that I got here at the American Antiquarian Society. So this has been a really great, really one of the, like, the biggest intellectual homes of this project. Um, and so I'm happy to be back here and talking to you all about it. Um, so as Nan mentioned, uh, the title of this book is Beauty and the Brain, The Science of Human Nature in Early America. Um, this book is a project, it's an early history of psychology, but it's a history of psychology before psychology was technically a discipline. <laughs> um, so instead of doing a history of psychology, um, this book is a history of physiognomy and phrenology. 
I don't know how many of you are early Americanists or how many of you um, know much about physiognomy and phrenology. Usually people kind of know about phrenology, um, but physiognomy tends to be a little bit more obscure. Um, <laughs> so physiognomy is just, uh, in the simplest terms, a discipline rooted in the idea that people's facial features reveal their character. So uh, it's the idea that like, if I want to figure out how smart you are, or if you're going to be a good mother, or if you're going to be a good researcher at the American Antiquarian Society, or <laughs> a successful historian, or photographer, or anything, right? You can just look at someone's face and, uh, and analyze their facial features and, and see basically the deepest, darkest inner secrets of their soul. Um, so physiognomy, oh, there's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, physiognomy is a discipline, it's an ancient discipline that stretches back at least to the ancient Greeks, but um, it becomes newly popular in the 1770s. Um, and that's because a man named Johann Caspar Lavater, who's a reverend actually, um, he writes a four volume treatise on uh, facial analysis and promises people that you can analyze people's faces, not just in an artistic or kind of casual way, but you can actually do so scientifically. Um, and so he lays out a whole bunch of rules for how to analyze people's faces. None of these rules actually, like he doesn't, he says he's laying out a mathematical system. He doesn't actually lay out a mathematical system, um, but that's what he, he claims he's doing. Um, and so physiognomy spreads all throughout Europe um, throughout the 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s. And it's really in the 1790s that physiognomy becomes um, particularly popular in, in the United States. And then, building on the popularity of physiognomy, you have the emergence of phrenology. How many of you are familiar with phrenology generally? Okay, yeah, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so a few of you, but uh, phrenology, it kind of builds on the insights of physiognomy in the way that they say that your face can reveal your character. Phrenologists take that as like the given, right? That your face reveals your character. But then they say, but actually the physiognomists were not scientific enough. And so what we need to do is instead of just analyzing facial features, what we need to do is also analyze the bumps and the crevices of the human cranium. Because the phrenologists are actually the first to argue <laughs> that the brain is what they call the organ of the mind, um, and that the brain is split up into different parts. So, um, and this is true, right? Um, so they're kind of the first advocates of cerebral localization, the idea that like different parts of your brain control different aspects of your character, personality, um, and just different parts of your, your body. Um, and so the phrenologists argue this, and so they say, like, you can't just study the brain as a whole, you have to study the various pieces of the brain. So they argue that, for instance, your forehead, this region, the front part of your brain, is associated with your intellect. So if any of you have heard the phrase highbrow, lowbrow, um, comes from the phrenologists and the physiognomists, um, because if we say something's highbrow, we, we're like, oh, it's sophisticated, it's refined, right? Um, that comes from a scientific discipline that quite literally said if you had a large forehead, then you were smarter than everyone else. Um, <laughs> so the forehead is associated with intelligence. They associate um, the kind of like top and middle portions of the brain with your spiritual qualities um, or your moral qualities. So if you're going to be a generous person, if you're going to be a religious person, if you're going to be selfish, if you're going to be destructive, those are the parts that you'll see on the kind of top and middle areas. And then the back part of your brain is allegedly associated with what they call your animal propensities. Um, so this is, uh, they associate with your libido, for instance, right? So if you have a large lump at the bottom of your neck, um, that means that your brain is protruding in that area. Um, and as a result, then you'll be able to identify someone's high sex drive and you're really by analyzing their, um, their cranium. But they also say that like, because motherhood and parenthood generally um, is something that's associated with the back of your head. So if you, you have a lump, if, if you have a lump here, that means you're a good parent. And if you have a big lump that's slightly lower, that means that you really um, enjoy being in the bedroom with others. <laughs> um, so phrenology becomes this massively popular craze that spreads throughout the throughout Europe and, and throughout um, the United States um, and, and all over the globe in fact um, but in the United States people begin using it to um, kind of understand human character and it becomes a popular science that you can access in many different places so um, phrenological workshops open up in big cities like Boston Philadelphia and New York so you can actually go into a workshop and get your face or your head red um, people People talk about it at dinner parties, people talk about it on the streets, people talk about it in newspapers. You basically can't read an American novel published in the early part, the first half of the 19th century without seeing some sort of phrenological or physiognomical <clears throat> phrasing. 
they're not always identified as, like, they don't say, like, and now in this novel we shall engage in physiognomy or phrenology, but they're using the language of science in literature. So these are sciences that are spreading not just um, in, in popular culture, but also in elite intellectual circles and also in, in art and literature. So they're kind of popular sciences that are spreading um, through all aspects of, of the American community. So in this project, what I wanted to do was two things. First, I, oh, this skipped ahead. Okay, there's a slide missing. Anyways, um, so first what I wanted to do um, is I wanted to actually take these sciences and take them seriously. I know I was kind of joking around about like telling whether or not someone was a good photographer or a good parent, um, but I kind of wanted to to step away from just mocking these sciences and actually treat them seriously as sciences, not because I think that they are in fact legitimate technologies for analyzing human character, because I don't. Like I'm not gonna actually go around and, and do head or, or facial analyses um, later on today, um, but early Americans did. And early Americans took these sciences seriously. And as a result, I think that we have to take them seriously because if we don't, then we're not gonna understand the cultural and intellectual universe of the people that we're studying. So if you just kind of, it might be easy <laughs> for us to dismiss them as these quirky pseudosciences that have no merit and no meaning and we can kind of laugh at, and that might make us feel good, um, but it doesn't help us understand the historical actors that we're actually trying to study. So I, um, you'll notice throughout this presentation, I use the word science to describe physiognomy and phrenology rather than pseudoscience. Um, pseudoscience is basically retroactively labeling something fake that people at the time thought was real. <laughs> um, and so as a result, um, I think that the first like big thrust of this book is to say like, no, actually, I think we have to take these sciences for what they were at that particular historical moment. Um, the other main goal that I had with this project was to get a sense of how people made sense of human difference and inequality. So um, after the United States <laughs> establishes itself as a nation, they are establishing themselves as a nation in a country that, uh, a country in which inequality is not supposed to exist, right? Like you have these grand ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. You're creating a country that's ostensibly dedicated to liberty, justice, and equality, right? Like everyone is supposed to be equal. And yet, as we all know, the early American Republic was not an equal place. Um, and there's many ways in which there, uh, America today is still not an equal place, right? So my question was kind of like, okay, so how do people rationalize that to themselves, right? Like how did they make sense of their ostensible commitment to liberty and equality and justice on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, live with the very real inequalities that just surrounded them every day, right? Like how did they rationalize that? How did they make it make sense? And how did they use science to do so? Um, so that first question, is not an original question. This is a question that early American historians in particular have been asking for decades. It's like, why didn't the American Revolution live up to its revolutionary promises? Like, why didn't you, why didn't we get equality, you know? Um, so that's, that's a question that historians have always been asking, but I wanted to a answer it or address it through this very particular lens, which was the history of, of popular science. Um, so in my project, I basically came to two main conclusions. The first was that science is a weapon of oppression sometimes. Um, this, in this project, it became very clear to me that the privileged and the powerful were using science to argue that some people's brains were simply better than other people's brains and that some people's bodies were superior to other people's bodies. And if some people had better brains and bodies, then perhaps that meant that like they were successful because they were genetically superior. They're not using the language of genes at this point, right? But they're arguing like, well, maybe, you know, maybe that guy isn't a prosperous businessman because he got unfair advantages. Maybe he just had a better brain than everyone else, right? And we can see that he had a better brain than everyone else simply by analyzing his face or his cranium. Um, but on the other hand, what I found most surprising about this project was that actually science was both a weapon of oppression and a tool of liberation used by ordinary people, white women, um, African-Americans, abolitionists, women's rights activists, social radicals, reformers of all stripes. 
Um, I was repeatedly confronted with this fact in the archives that like the people who are most enthusiastic about these sciences are often not the scientific racists who are trying to justify slavery. They're enthusiastic about these sciences too, but for different reasons, right? Um, but often it's black abolitionists or women's rights activists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who um, thinks phrenology is great and might eventually prove the equality of male and female brains. Um, and so in this project, I think what I'm, I'm trying to do is not only take physiognomy and phrenology seriously as sciences, um, but also show how people use them for competing political aims at the very same time and kind of lay out that process by which um, that happened. Um, so ultimately, I'm uh, trying to, I want to give you some examples um, of how I approach that process and some of, like, give you some examples of the evidence that I use to kind of show how ordinary people um, and women in particular use this science to make sense of the female brain. Um, so I have like a million different examples. This project is based on, on court records, on uh, novels, on newspapers and magazines, on um, the writings of black abolitionists, on the writings of feminists, you know, like Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, but I just wanted to give you some of the, the, um, the selections from the American Antiquarian Society. So first, I'm going to show you some examples of how people used science to reify hierarchies of race, class, and gender. Um, and then I want to show you how women kind of worked around <laughs> some of those discourses and used them for their own purposes. Does anyone recognize who these people are? Actually, I might have put it up here. Oh, no, they're not up there. <laughs> Any guesses on who this might be on, over here on the right? George III. George III, no, um, but same era. Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is Benjamin Franklin. This is supposedly George Washington. <clears throat> Uh, this print appeared in, remember how I told you that man, the Swiss reverend, uh, wrote these four volume treatises on physiognomy? He, uh, in some of the later editions, incorporated portraits or silhouettes of American revolutionary leaders um, in order to kind of like include the Americans into his physiognomic treatises. And Americans get very excited about this because they're, they're beginning a new nation, right? So they want to be included. Um, and so they reprint it in, in American magazines. Um, and they use images like this. They're accompanied with detailed descriptions of the faces of George Washington and, and uh, Benjamin Franklin. And they use this to argue that some people are actually just superior specimens of humanity. And as a result, they are uniquely suited to lead the country in this new national Republican experiment. Um, so I have some cool examples of Abigail Adams writing to John Adams, her husband and the second president of the United States about how she meets Ben Franklin and George Washington. These are in different letters, um, but she meets both Ben Franklin and George Washington on different occasions. And she then writes letters to her husband in which she physiognomically analyzes their faces. Um, and she says, you know, when she meets Ben Franklin, that Ben Franklin, you can see that he's like a dignified statesman um, by the look on his face. And when she meets George Washington, she's like, you can see the mild mannered moral character mixed with the martial man, you know? So there's this idea that like certain people have certain characteristics that make them uniquely suited to lead this new nation in its Republican pursuit. Um, and that you can actually see those characteristics on the face. This really ramps up in the middle decades of the 19th century. So um, this is uh, an image of Danny Webster and, and John C. Calhoun. Um, these are two of the most famous politicians of the middle decades of the 19th century. And phrenologists are obsessed with them. Because these, if, if you wanted to be like considered the most attractive, intelligent looking man of say like the 1840s, this is, these are your models. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> these, are, these men are repeatedly, especially Daniel Webster, um, these men are repeatedly held up as uh, superior phrenological specimens. Um, Daniel Webster, he's actually kind of drawn here with an even more exaggerated forehead because the forehead was supposed to be the signal of intelligence. And so they, you know, he, he does have a, a big forehead generally, but like they draw him, they exaggerate it, they make the eyes dark. Um, so they portray him as a, as a very serious man with a, um, a superior intellect. Um, and they will often say that John C. Calhoun's face reflects his firmness of spirit and his unwillingness to compromise on issues that matter to him. Um, so basically, they um, there's 
kind of like physiognomic and phrenological portrait galleries that start showing up in the nation's artwork, in newspapers and magazines, um, that show people supposedly what a good leader looks like and what a good politician looks like. So these are, are supposed to be um, the physiognomic models of the early American Republic. But you probably guessed um, that this is not just used to elevate people that they think of as superior, it's also used to denigrate other people as inferior. Um, so physiognomy and phrenology end up serving as part of this kind of growing tradition of scientific racism within the United States, um, in which they argue, again, that like, some people's faces are simply better, like some people simply have better craniums, um, and you can tell that by yeah. analyzing them. The most um, kind of destructive idea that comes out of physiognomy is the idea of the facial angle. So it's not just physiognomists and phrenologists that advocate for the facial angle. Um, it's adopted by a bunch of um, other scientific thinkers in, in emerging disciplines like craniology and craniometry and, and <coughs> early versions of anthropology. But the logic is essentially very simple and, and deceptively simple and also, I mean, not valid, but um, I think we all assume that. So it's this idea that you can draw a line straight from the forehead down through the mouth, and then you can draw another line from the nose to the ear, and then you can just measure the angle that it makes. Um, there's this idea that if you, because they associate the forehead with intellect, they associate the jaw with animal propensities. So if your jaw extends past your forehead, then your angle is going to be smaller, right? And as a result, they argue that that means that you're less intelligent. So they use this measure of the facial angle to argue that people of color and people of African descent in particular um, are simply less intelligent because they have lower facial angles. But of course, this is a metric that they created on their own. Um, it doesn't actually indicate intelligence. Uh, it just indicates, you know, it just measures what, what they are, are trying to measure. Um, so ultimately, physiognomy and phrenology end up kind of laying this groundwork for the rise of biological determinism, which is just this idea that like your body and your brain determine your future, your body determines your destiny, um, and you're actually stuck in your body. Like you can't do anything to change it. So if you're born with an inferior skull, right, inferior, then sorry, like there's nothing that you can do. Um, so physiognomy and phrenology kind of lay the groundwork for, for later versions of skull analysis. Um, and eventually these become the basis for eugenics, which becomes popular in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, physiognomists also, physiognomists and phrenologists mm -hmm. also use their science to draw distinctions of ethnicity. Um, Whenever I show this to my students, they say that Bridget McBruiser looks like the Grinch who stole Christmas. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is um, from a physiognomical uh, treatise in 1866. They're comparing Florence Nightingale, who is a British reformer um, and nurse and, you know, widely respected figure, with a fictional person called Bridget McBruiser, who is just supposed to stand in for any Irish woman that, like, exists, right? Um, so they describe um, Florence Nightingale as bright intellectual and spiritual, which you can supposedly see on her face. Um, and then they describe Bridget McBruiser, who again, is a fictional person. There's not like a woman running around named Bridget. Well, maybe there is, I mean, but <laughs> they just created her for the purposes of this book. Um, they call her opaque, dull, and sensual, um, and say that she lives in the basement mentally as well as bodily, and that she was governed by the lower or animal passions. You'll see this language over and over again with the animal passions or the animal propensities. Um, that's typically, so they say the brain is largely divided into three parts. Um, they say the intellect is here, the spiritual is here, and the lower passions are here. Um, and the lower passions are also kind of associated with the jaw. Um, so this is how they kind of use science to create distinctions of ethnicity. They also use science to argue that men and women are distinct beings with different bodies and different brains, and as a result, that men and women are suited for different occupations in life. So they argue that you can tell from a woman's face that she is domestic, submissive, pious, spiritual, um, and kind, right? And those traits they associate with like 
rounded features. So um, if you have a short forehead, but round features and like chubby cheeks, then that means you'll make a good wife because you're not the smartest in the world, right? But at least <laughs> you're gonna care for your husband, you know? Um, so they argue, <laughs> they argue that men by contrast are um, intellectual and strong and firm. Um, and not every man is like this and not every woman, you know, like they allow for distinctions between, between these two groups and they allow for variety within um, genders, but they ultimately argue like there are masculine faces and there are feminine faces. I want to give you an example from a little bit later on. This goes past the period of my book, but I just think it's so perfect that I had to include it. Um, so this is um, from a journal called Human Nature, which is published. Um, <clears throat> it's a phrenological journal that's published like way after phrenology loses its popularity within the United States. But it so perfectly uh, synthesizes some of the phrenological ideas that start circulating in the early part of the 19th century. So they compare these two women and they say, which is domestic? Describing this first woman, woman here, they say she represents the typical mother and model wife. Her life is devoted to her husband and children. She is not intellectually great, but she is good, which compensates for her lack of wisdom. <laughs> so she's a good woman, you know, but she's not intellectually great. Okay. Describing pet number two. <laughs> <laughs> Children and birds are instinctively repelled from a woman of this description. Not even children and birds like her. Um, while the most ardent man would be chilled to ice in her presence, she is a stranger to love and sentiment, a woman of dry facts, devoted to selfish gain. But that's not all. <laughs> um, her features are sharp, indicating keenness of selfish instinct. If she should succeed in inveigling a poor white into marriage, his life would be beset with thorns and his ears regaled with nightly curtain lectures. So <laughs> basically there's this idea that like, you can tell if someone's gonna be a good wife just by analyzing their face and head. And if you find a woman with sharp features, um, who doesn't have the rounded features, who doesn't have, um, actually plumpness is seen as like a, a positive sign in the middle decades of the 19th century. Um, then if you get into a bad marriage, like you have no one but yourself to blame um, because all of these traits are, are visible on, on a human body. So my question in this project is like, why, right? Why is it, because I keep finding evidence of all of these women who are like, no, I think phreno like, phrenology is great. You know, so like phrenologists are publishing things like this. And then you have women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Abby Kelly, um, who's a famous abolitionist whose papers are here at the American Antiquarian Society, loves phrenology um, and, and uses it uh, to analyze herself and, and others. Frederick Douglass, um, is a man who sees the problems with phrenology because he knows that white scientific thinkers are using it to discriminate, but he doesn't give up on it entirely. And he sees it actually as kind of an ethical alternative to other disciplines like craniometry. Um, you have Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who, or Lucretia Mott, or William Lloyd Garrison. Sojourner Truth goes to get her head examined. Um, and all of these, all of these radical activists are kind of embracing or at least not rejecting these sciences and using them in their everyday life. So I'm like, why, right? Like what is going on? Um, so I have a lot to say on that and you can, you can ask me in the questions, but what I want to focus on tonight um, is how women embrace these sciences and adapted them for their own purposes. So part of the reason why women embrace these sciences is because they are ubiquitous and accessible. This is a time when women are blocked from most institutions of um, higher education. I mean, they can go to female academies and seminaries, but they cannot go to colleges. Um, they cannot go to medical school for the most part, right? So what they can do is they can buy a phrenological journal. They can go to a phrenological workshop. They can discuss phrenolo like phrenology in their drawing rooms or in their parlors. They can read about it in newspapers and magazines and novels. Um, they can uh, talk about it with you know, their friends and family members. These are, um, or they can go to scientific lectures by traveling phrenologists and physiognomists who are going around analyzing people's heads, right? So this isn't a knowledge form that is accessible to everyone. It's not kind of blocked off to um, elite white men who are studying scientific disciplines in, in colleges. Um, but in addition to that, phrenologists especially actively market their disciplines to female users. And they say, in fact, that women are some of the best phrenologists and physiognomists and, and the most necessary phrenologists and physiognomists because um, 
women are the rearers of the future generation of American citizens. Like they are raising all the children. And so if women are raising all the children, then it's their job to like analyze their children and figure out, you know, like how do I, how do I mold my son or daughter into a, a good citizen? Um, so phrenologists say not only that women should be users of phrenology um, and experts in phrenology, but that actually they, it's almost more important for women to use phrenology than it is for men to use phrenology. Um, this is a collection from the American Antiquarian Society um, of Lorenzo Fowler, who's a famous phrenologist who analyzes the head of Lucy Watson, Draper Ryder. Um, he tells her, after this whole analysis of her personality, he kind of adds in this little aside where he's like, by the way, you have the faculties to advance quite rapidly as a scholar, and you'd be much interested in phrenology. <laughs> so he's kind of like using his personal analysis of, of her head to tell her, like, you're very smart, and you'd be very good at phrenology, and you should pursue it further. So some of the phrenological lecturers that start going throughout the country are actually women. Um, and women become some of the people who are running um, the phrenological businesses in the United States. Um, and actually, um, Lorenzo Fowler's wife becomes the, only the second woman in the United States to get a medical degree from an American medical school. Um, so she's right behind uh, Elizabeth Backwell. Um, so clearly, you know, the phrenologists are, are used to being surrounded by intellectual women, and they're not threatened by it, and they're actually encouraging women to to foster their scientific knowledge. But that does not mean that phrenologists are always telling women what they want to hear. Um, there's a really cool example in the American Antiquarian Society collections of the diaries of Lucy Chase, who gets her head analyzed by a phrenologist, and she's really annoyed by the reading. Um, she says that the phrenologist told her that I must not study, that my brain is too large, my physical strength was much inferior to my mental, and that I much labor and I shall be obliged uh, to set aside entirely my course of study and try to be a character that has always been unpleasant to me to contemplate, a very common character. So Lucy Chase is someone who writes openly in her journal about how she's jealous of her brother for getting to go to college. She very much values herself as an intellectual, and she's very interested in phrenology. And so she gets this personalized reading, and the phrenologist is like, yo, you're too smart. Like, stop obsessing so much about your studies, and she's annoyed by it. Um, and so a little over a month later, uh, she ends up having to take uh, her domestic servant's place in the kitchen um, because she, her, uh, she gets measles. Um, and so she, say, I, she says, I presume Fowler, the phrenologist, would say that that's the place for me. Like as like a kind of snotty aside, like he wants me to be in the kitchen and I want to be learning. <laughs> but all that said, she still remains enormously invested in phrenology. She corners Fowler at a dinner party and she's like, hey, like, how, how can I get what she calls a well-balanced head? Um, she, she asks him for advice. She keeps reading phrenological treatises. She keeps going to phrenological lectures. Like this kind of um, antagonistic relationship with the phrenologist does not then translate into like her not being interested in phrenology anymore. Um, she still remains interested in the science. And this is something that I see kind of over and over and over again in, in the archives, where it's like women recognize the problems with the phrenological discourse, but they, they still remain sort of invested in it. And that I think is in part because women valued scientific knowledge as a symbol of their own refinement. Like, demonstrating a facility with phrenology or physiognomy was a way to show that you were smart, scientifically literate, and informed, right? Like, and it was a way to show that you were a member of the middle classes who, who knew how to use scientific knowledge. Um, and you can see this in the letter of a Quaker activist, Anna Breed, to Abby Kelly, who is one of the most famous um, abolitionist lecturers of the 19th century. <laughs> Abby Kelly is very interested in phrenology, and so are most of her friends, and so they write letters about it. Um, and in this letter, Anna Breed, she's kind of being a little snotty about other women, the other women of Lynn, Massachusetts. She thinks that they're kind of frivolous and that they're not concerned with serious intellectual topics in the same way that like her and her abolitionist friends are. Um, <coughs> but she has a, she has a good night <laughs> um, with friends that she considers to be intellectually stimulating. And so she's writing to Abby Kelly about it and saying like that she really enjoyed herself. And she goes, and what did we talk about? Not about pretty babies, nor new gowns and caps. Possible, and in Lynn too. Our principal subjects were phrenology, physiology, physiognomy, the climate of the South, residence there, J.G. Whittier and his poetry. So for her, like, it's a mark of a frivolous woman to discuss dresses and babies. But it's the mark of an educated and refined woman to discuss physiognomy and phrenology and things like this. So, um, it, like, being facile with these sciences is a way that women are, are showing that, like, actually, no, I care about science and I'm, and I'm just as smart as, as everyone else.
You can kind of also see this. Um, this is a really, really cool source. So Mary Virginia, oh, I, I took out the word. Um, her last name is Mary Virginia Montgomery. Um, she started her life as an enslaved woman in the South. Um, she actually belonged to, technically belonged, right, as much as a person can belong to someone else, um, belonged to the brother of the president of the Confederacy. Um, but her family was very committed to intellectual advancement. So even from a young age, as an enslaved child, they're teaching her how to read, they're buying her books, they're, you know, so she basically, by the time she becomes to be an adult, she has the same level of ed education as like a white middle-class northerner. Um, but part of that education was reading phrenological books. Um, and so she writes in her journal in the 1870s, this is after the Civil War, she already has, she's um, a free woman at this point, but she writes about um, reading the American Phrenological Journal. She owns a phrenological bust. She practices on the phrenological bust. And then so one night she'll be like, yeah, I was reading in my phrenological journal. And then the next night she's like, yeah, I was reading Plutarch or like she's reading Darwin's Origin of Species. She's conducting um, what she calls crystallizing experiments um, with a chemistry textbook that she purchased. So she's very committed to her own intellectual advancement. And for her, like phrenology is both something that brings amusement and pleasure and also part of these broader intellectual pursuits. Um, so she eventually ends up going to Oberlin College. And when she goes, she... Um, on her journey there, she talks about kind of experiencing discrimination and also homesickness on the trip. Um, and she writes about phrenology as something that kind of brings her joy and solace as she's experiencing um, homesickness and, um, and despair along this kind of journey to Oberlin. Um, so phrenology for her, it's like kind of like a fun activity. Like it's not probably as serious as Darwin's Origin of Species, but she's reading both together and like considering both to be useful, valuable forms of scientific knowledge. So this is what I mean when I say like, phrenology and physiognomy are not just limited to elite white men practicing science in universities. They are spreading to the enslaved population. They are um, spreading to, um, to white women in the North and in the South in, and in the West, you know, there are phrenological lecturers that like, as, the, um, as people are expanding westward, phrenological lecturers are going with them. Um, and one of those phrenological lectures is the son of John Brown, the famous abolitionist. Um, he works for the Fowler and Wells team. Um, and so he kind of brings phrenology west with him as he goes. Um, so this is like a science that is infiltrating itself into ordinary life and into progressive um, political circles as well. So one of my major questions was like, why would a woman like Mary Virginia Montgomery actually like, how does she, how is she getting amusement and solace from the American Phrenological Journal, which is super racist. <laughs> um, and I think part of the answer, it's complicated, but part of the answer is that the American Phrenological Journal um, periodically does publish positive character sketches of African Americans. Um, they're often... They're often like subtly racist, so I'll just read you this one. So this is um, a phrenological sketch of a woman who was on the Amistad, which is the, um, the ship uh, where um, the enslaved captives of this ship kind of like overthrow um, the people who are, um, who are trying to enslave them and they get their freedom. So this is one of the women, um, and the American Phrenological does a very flattering sketch of her um, in the 1850s. Um, so they describe her as having independence, perseverance, energy, and unusual intellectual powers which is not something that they typically use for women generally or for black women in particular. Um, and they point out her forehead is broad and high. It's particularly prominent in the center. The whole head is large, sustained by a vigorous constitution. These are all positive things. Like these are words that they would use to describe Daniel Webster, but they're using them for a black woman. You know, so it's entirely possible that like a black woman reading the American Phrenological Journal is gonna encounter something like this. And she's gonna encounter something like this alongside you know, the racist messages that populate the journal. But there's also these kind of glimmers of like, well, yeah, actually phrenology doesn't universally mark black women as inferior. Um, but <laughs> they describe, after providing this like really kind of unequivocally positive portrayal of her, um, they say that she was far superior to Africans generally, right? So it's like, yeah, she's great, but like, other Africans are not like her. Um, and so that's a way that they kind of like move through it. So ultimately, all these people are kind of like embracing these sciences. And it's in large part because phrenologists and physiognomists consider themselves to be radicals and they support anti-slavery. They also support female suffrage like way before the American population does. Um, and they're the first, phrenologist publishers are the first people to publish the volume, The History of Women's Suffrage. <laughs> um, so they, are really like if you were to ask them, they consider themselves to be on the radical side. 
And that's how Abby Kelly, the abolitionist, sees it. She um, writes about reading the phrenologist Orson Fowler, and she goes, I'm quite captivated with his straightforwardness and his blunt radicalism. Um, and that's because they advocate a kind of flexible idea of the human mind and body, which comes down to two main ideas. Phrenologists and physiognomists ultimately believe that all humans are universally equal, <laughs> not that they don't have different faculties and different propensities, but that all human brains are fundamentally the same. Um, and that is something that other scientists are beginning to challenge in the 1830s especially. Um, and they also argue that every human being has a capacity for self-betterment so that you can improve your brain. They literally argue like if you study, your brain will improve and as it improves, it'll like get bigger in all the right areas and then like pop out and push your skull to make your skull more, more attractive like as you educate yourself. <laughs> Um, now, they do this in very condescending ways, right? So they kind of argue, like, if everyone can improve your brain, if you haven't improved your brain, like, you've got no one but yourself to blame, right? Um, and ultimately, like, it ends up having, the science ends up having its um, drawbacks. So, like, by accepting physiognomy and phrenology, um, people end up, progressive activists and ordinary people who embrace it, they end up kind of validating the idea that external beauty is, in fact, a sign of internal worth. Um, and they also concede that human value can be determined by scientific study, right? Um, and in doing so, they end up lending credence to a lot of discriminatory ideas that are circulating at the time. So even though, you know, they feel hope and, and energy alongside the science, like there are problems to it as well. Um, because science is not inevitably just a tool of liberation, it's also, um, it's also a weapon of oppression, and it can be both of those things simultaneously. And I think that um, the history of physiognomy and phrenology kind of reminds us that it can be both. And like a science doesn't just have to be something that like <laughs> lays the groundwork for scientific racism. It can be multiple things at once. Um, but I also think this history is important because it reminds us that white people and white men in particular are not the only people producing scientific knowledge in early America. There's a vibrant, confusing sometimes, contradictory, complex scientific universe that all of these people are working together to create. Um, and ultimately, like, if we don't understand that complex and contradictory universe, then we're not going to understand the historical subjects that we care so much about studying. And we're not going to understand how they comprehended abstract concepts. Like, what did race mean to them? What did beauty mean to them? What did gender mean to them? What did, what did it mean to, like, talk about intelligence in the 19th century? If you don't understand physiognomy and phrenology, like you don't understand how people understood race, gender, beauty, intelligence. Like this is how they made sense of those categories. So it can be really easy for us to look back at disciplines like physiognomy and phrenology and just dismiss them as racist or sexist um, or dangerous. And I think they were dangerous and problematic and bad in many ways. But if we just dismiss them, sure, we might feel a little smarter or more thoughtful or more scientifically advanced than all of these people that came before us. Um, but ultimately, that's kind of just a way of burnishing our own egos and feeling good about ourselves rather than understanding the time period that we're trying to study. And I don't think that that's a particularly useful exercise because I think the job of a historian, at least in my mind, is to recover a previous world and to sit in that world and like recapture its contours and try to make people, readers, understand what it was like to exist at that particular historical moment. Um, and so, yeah, sure, it might feel good to just dismiss a, a historical moment of the past, but I think it's, it's ultimately valuable to try and recover things that seem especially confusing to us. Um, obviously, I'm biased, right? But I think that this subject in particular is valuable and it's exciting precisely because it reminds me to be a little humble. Um, and it reminds me that the definition of science has always been changing, that culture has always been changing, and that all of the things that like we think of as natural and normal and moral and right, right, all of those things are going to change too, right? So it keeps us like embracing the spirit of intellectual humility as opposed to intellectual arrogance. Um, so speaking of intellectual humility, I'm so humbled by the fact that you all came out to hear about my work. <laughs> um, thanks for welcoming me back to the American Antiquarian Society and thanks for listening. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have some time for questions. So we can take questions from the audience here, but also uh, in YouTube. So I will bring the microphone to the audience here. Hi. <laughs> That's just so people in Thank YouTube can you. hear better. Hello, YouTube. Hello, everyone. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Hi. This is wonderful. Oh, you here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, flew up to D from Dallas just for this. Ah, I bet. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for this. This is wonderful. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've heard this book evolve over time and to, to see it now is, is just so wonderful. I was, uh, would love to hear a bit, a broad question. How and where does capitalism fit into this? Because there was that quote from human nature about selfish gain. Yeah. And I just was wondering if, you know, how was the kind of evolving industrial capitalism of the 19th century playing a part in, if at all, mm -hmm. this interest in these particular sciences? So I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I only wrote about it for like two pages in the book, which is <laughs> um, maybe a mistake. But OK, so in the same way, basically, um, they're phrenologists become they create this like big business in um, the 18. 40s and 50s in particular, um, and the family that runs that business, like they're friends with um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and like all of these people who are active in the women's rights movement. They are also um, anti-slavery, even though, but they are way more likely to speak out about women's rights in the pages of their books than about um, anti-slavery until after the Civil War. Um, but they are also anti-capitalist, which is like funny because they are like capitalists, you know? Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, Orson Fowler kind of like goes off on this rant about how um, the rising industrial class is exploiting workers. And as a result of exploiting workers, they're not giving them time for intellectual cultivation. And he's ultimately making, you know, those like labor union arguments that come up in like the late 19th century where they're like, we need time for like rest and for culture and to read and, and all this stuff. He is making those arguments in the pages of the American Phrenological Journal. Um, so that like basically industrial capitalists are ruining America and making everyone concerned with selfish gain um, and that they're not giving people time to like really cultivate their minds. But of course, then he's like creating big business. Yeah. Um, so it's complicated, right? Um, which as all these and they're also like anti-death penalty. Um, so but then they create all of these bonds. So they're anti-death penalty. But then they will go into prisons and they'll create deals with um, prisoners who are about to be executed. That's like, hey, can I have your skull to like display in my store after you're gone? And like, I'll give you some cigarettes or, you know, like what, whatever you like <laughs> what you need. So they're trading. They're often trading alcohol with like prisoners who are about to be executed, even though they're also temperance advocates. You know, so it's just a, a whole sea of contradictions. Um, but they do feel really strongly about how capitalism is exploitative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions in the room? Okay. Uh, hey, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, um, like, support of women for these, for their, like, especially the women that you're talking about who are pretty powerful women to to begin with. And I was wondering, like, do you think that in a way, because phrenology does attach meaning to like shapes and yeah. it, rather than just a type, like a gender type, that they can be kind of the unicorn of their type. Yes. And, and even with like, um, uh, like some of the African American people that you mentioned, like, anyway, I was wondering if you could talk about it. Yeah, I mean, Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are two very good examples of this, where they basically consider themselves to be like unicorn, like we're, we're the special ones, you know? So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she is annoyed with phrenologists because she's like, oh, turns out every time they find a skull that they like it, they describe it. So like Elizabeth Cady Stanton points out that like when phrenologists find um, skulls of women that they mark as intellectually superior, they always describe those skulls, even though they're of women, as masculine. And so she's like, annoyed. she's like, oh yeah, of course, like for a woman to be smart, you have to describe her, like you have to use the adjective masculine in order to describe. 
Or if there's like a skull of a man that they don't think is smart, they're like, oh, well, he's a man, but he has a feminine skull. Um, so she's annoyed by things like that. And Frederick Douglass is annoyed by phrenologists like always kind of creating caricatures of African-Americans. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton's like, but my skull. <laughs> and like Susan B. Anthony too, they get, they both get skull readings in the same year. She thinks that she, like her skull reading is very accurate. She writes to her father who thinks phrenology is stupid. And she um, writes to her father kind of like bragging. She's like, please indulge me. Like, I'm really proud of it. You know, so, and Frederick Douglass also, um, he kind of is like, well, yeah, all of these phrenologists are painting these derogatory caricatures of African Americans, um, but he also like thinks he has a really great face, you know. Um, and and that's why like part of the reason why he becomes um, he becomes the most photographed American in the 19th century, right? Like, and he he argues he's like you know I think that all these white scientists he makes two exceptions of two white scientists that he doesn't think are super discriminatory, one of whom is a phrenologist and one of whom is a natural historian. Um, but Frederick Douglass still complains about phrenologists, but he's like, well, they should be painting, like, they should be painting the heads of people like me or Martin Delaney or like, you know, James McCune Smith. Like, they're just not focusing on the right African Americans. So there is, because there's so much flexibility in this science, there's a way in which like everyone can believe that they're the exception to the gendered or the racialized rule. Yeah. So uh, I have a question of just as a follow up. Mm -hmm. to that. It, since this is such an important year for Phyllis Wheatley, mm -hmm. the 150th anniversary of the publication of her first book of poetry, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Phyllis, the, that iconic image of Phyllis Wheatley was used by both Black and white authors for their own purposes. Yeah, um, Black authors become obsessed with that image in the 1850s. Um, and there has, I don't know if anyone's heard of the African American um, Picture Gallery. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. So um, it's a it's a collection of basically ekphrastic like descriptions of images that don't actually exist. So they guide you through a fictional um, photo gallery or a fictional art gallery um, and kind of describe what they see there. But in that, um, in the African-American picture gallery, there's a very detailed physiognomical description of Phyllis Wheatley's face. Um, and so they talk about how Phyllis Wheatley has a 90 degree facial angle. Um, the facial angle 90 degrees is supposed to be seen as like the ultimate indication of the most intelligent person. Um, and so there's like a black author, right, being like, I'm going to describe this fictional portrait of Phyllis Wheatley, which is probably, you know, based on the portrait that exists. Um, and describes her as having an intellectual forehead, describes her as having, you know, a countenance that indicates her spirituality, um, describes her as having a 90 degree mm -hmm. facial angle. Um, and so black authors are kind of describing like, look, here's an, here's an example of black genius. Um, and then there's also white abolitionists who describe that image as well. Um, and the white <laughs> abolitionists are often like, look, she's kind of like an exception. It, it, it's more kind of like condescending, right? Um, where it's like, yes, there are examples of black Americans that can be, you know, intellectually exceptional. Um, but yeah, and scientific racists, it's interesting, they don't challenge the 90 degree facial angle in like, mm. when they talk about it, they're like, well, she's just the exception, you know, she's different <laughs> um, than everyone else, yeah. Okay, we have a question from YouTube. Yeah. So did your research include anything on the Sarah Bartman case? Does phrenology affect the view of Sarah Bartman? Yeah, I mean, I, so I read, obviously read a bunch about Sarah Bartman in the process of this. Um, they're, because they're so focused, so this is the, um, the, the woman that kind of becomes famous for uh, her, like, uh, for being the so-called hot and hot Venus, right? Um, so as a black woman um, with, um, kind of large derriere, I suppose, um, that becomes basically like a symbol of just like white racism on display. Um, but because they're so focused on her body, they actually don't talk about her face that much. Um, yeah, so I, I like looked into it, but no, there's like not, there's so much focus on like her physical form and not her face, which is actually rare for the time because normally the focus is on the face and the head, yeah. Okay, another question. Uh, just a quick comment. Yeah. My grandmother uh, studied from a Rand McNally geography book published in 1901, mm -hmm. which I still have. Oh, wow. And there's a section called The Grades of Culture and the Races of Man. Yep. Now, this would have been my grandmother. She yep. was born in 1900. And they talk about the white man has a high forehead, uh, you know, He's, 
then there's the yellow man who has kind of a slopey forehead and his face is round. And then we have the a red man, you know, and then the black man in Africa with liquid eyes and a large, broad nose and thick lips and a prognathous jaw. Yeah, this is all language taken from physiognomists mm. and phrenologists. And, and when you get to the culture, they yeah. had a problem because the white men, not women, of course, but wh white men and the yellow man both were literate. So how do you distinguish between white people and yellow people? And the answer was spirituality. Huh. You know? How and the, interesting. And the, the um, black man was described, this was the vocabulary word, as a savage. Uh -huh. And this meant that they, uh, gather, they were hunter-gatherers. And the yellow man w was, um, you know, he had culture he ate a lot of rice and such and the but the black man never rose from the condition of savagery oh God. without help from white people and the red man i haven't read this recently but yeah. the, the red man hunter they were savages barbarians civilized and enlightened mm -hmm. and you can guess which words Go with yeah, each group. Yeah. And this would have been my own grandmother. So G -G I admit I'm a little old, but it's not that long ago by generation. No, and a lot of these ideas kind of stick around way, even when people start saying like, oh, actually phrenology and physiognomy aren't sciences anymore. That begins happening largely in the 1860s, but they keep the ideas, you know, like, and they just repurpose them and they incorporate them into anthropology. Anthropology becomes a big kind of like harborer of these old ideas, even when people say that they've abandoned these popular sciences. One of the homework questions, have you ever seen a Chinese man? Oh no. Describe really him. Bad. Jeez. Other questions in the room? Yes. Thank you for your talk. Really interesting. Um, were there many cases of how these uh, sciences were used politically? Oh, yeah. Um, so they, they actually discuss phrenology on the floor of the um, on the floor of Congress when they are kind of criticizing Jackson, Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. Um, but George Poem in the 1830s, he's a famous phrenologist from um, from the UK and he comes to the United States and he does like a tour of Congress and he um, he meets and he has dinner with all the um, senators and and with the president and um, and so they use this kind of t like basically both political, like everyone on all political sides is kind of using these disciplines. So they use it to critique, like someone gives a, a speech on the floor of Congress about how like Jackson's firmness and destructiveness is going to like ruin the nation um, when they're um, debating, you know, like I think, I think it might be something related to the, you know, Jackson's bank bill, um, you know, uh, so they kind of like use it in, in public, um, but also just like in magazines, there's, there's so many, I mean, literally hundreds of political, of physiognomical sketches of politicians. Um, so at any time there's like a campaign profile, they do a physiognomical sketch a lot of the time of their facial features. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hi. I'm Dr. Vishakha. We are from India. So just wanted to ask you, uh, like your study, mm -hmm. and is it not going to influenced by genetics, geographical looks, and the families, like, you know, the genes how runs in the family. And we are not going to have the discrimination between the people if we have this study. Um, so like, are you thinking about like how people use it to like forge relationships and things like that? Yeah. So actually in India, so the British bring phrenology to India too. Um, but there are also like Indian practitioners of, of phrenology, like in India. <laughs> um, so this is like a science that literally has global reach. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the marriage, so they're actually early eugenics textbooks, basically. I mean, they don't call it eugenics, but it's basically like here's how to find a wife or here's how to find a husband that will genetically, they, again, they don't use the word genetically, but they're like, here's how to find someone that will give you um, fit and sound children. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But our, our physique, our anatomy, our physique, yeah. it depends on the geographical, like how we have developed evaluation, what we call it. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I mean, phrenologists kind of do talk about physique. Um, they have, you know, in manuals, they have, like, um, I didn't include them here, but the, just, like, models of the male and female body. Um, so you get kind of articulations of the idea. This is, begins in the late 18th century, but the idea that, like, you should be looking for a woman with large hips, for instance, um, is articulated in these phrenological manuals as well. So it's kind of like a grab bag of just different scientific ideas. They also have, um, in the Water Cure Journal, you can write in and, like, give your phrenological characteristics and, like, your bot your vigorous constitution and describe it. Um, and look, it's, like, online dating, but for, like, 19th century newspapers. Um, yeah, very, so there's very, lots of stuff going on. <laughs> very interesting session. Let me tell you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you again, Rachel, for a fantastic <laughs> talk. Thank you all for being here. And I want to uh, just let you know about some upcoming programs. So you can join us next Tuesday, uh, same time here in this space for a program featuring Layla Phillips on her book, Beaverland, How One Weird Rodent Changed America, uh, Made America, sorry. <laughs> um, and then the following Tuesday on May 23rd, Camille Dungy. Um, we'll be speaking on uh, this again. This will be a virtual only program on her new book, Soil, the Story of a Black Mother's Garden. Both of those um, speakers are former creative and performing artists, uh, fellows here at the Society. So thank you all for joining us both here and on YouTube. And we'll say good night.